Morning, Notre Dame. Thank you so much for tuning in to Dome Discourse Election 2020. We are so pleased to be back with you here this year. I'm Jackie Fletcher. I'm Jilly Randall, and let's get started. So, Jilly, you know, this election has been really interesting, and I think one of the hallmarks of it thus far, you know, back in March, even when we were still talking about the primaries, mm -hmm. Joe Biden said, I commit that I will, in fact, appoint a woman to be vice president. And we saw that he did do that in August. What does it mean to have Kamala Harris? as the vice presidential nominee? I mean, it's obviously a very powerful nomination. Um, I think a lot of people were expecting it, but as, as one of the first African-American, um, if she were elected, if they were elected, vice presidents, um, it's very powerful. But I have to say, I don't know if I fully agree with Biden's, you know, kind of already claiming the fact that he was going to nominate one of these, these uh, characteristics you know I don't know that didn't quite set well yeah do you me. think do you think that framing it as almost a her gender as a requirement was that kind of what settled yeah I think you? yeah you shouldn't have to like frame it like that you know yeah. it shouldn't have to be like one of the it, sh it should be who's the best candidate who you know mm -hmm. who will support your presidency the best yeah. not just because she's a woman or just because of her race you know mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely very interesting. I think it was also interesting that he declared it so early on. Very early. That's also, yeah. So early, which was so interesting. And then we did see that ultimately play and, out. And you have to think, is he just doing it for, for the votes? Yeah. You know? So. I know. So that was definitely something that was really interesting. I, I think it is also important to note, you know, a female on the candidates, especially after the 2016 election, mm -hmm. um, bringing, bringing that perspective back to the table. So it definitely should provide, especially during the vice presidential debates at least, yeah. a different perspective and, and some different clarity. Yeah, I'm of, really looking forward to that debate with Kamala and Pence, man. That's oh, going to be good. It's going to be good. It's <laughs> going to be good. So, I mean, move, moving on from Kamala, then she had her first really big debut at the DNC. Uh -huh. and, and those conventions were something else. They were really oh, something man. else this year. They were historical, unprecedented. We've never had conventions like that before. Mm -hmm. um, what were your favorite parts? Let's do best and worst of Ooh, RNC best and, and worst, DNC. Best and worst. Okay, well, I think, let, let's start with the DNC first. Let's okay. start with the DNC first. So I really admired, you know, that hate to use this term, unprecedented times. <laughs> they are, though, and I think These the DNC... unprecedented times. <laughs> and I think the DNC did do a really great job of navigating yeah. these uncertain circumstances. Definitely. With the video montages, they brought in celebrities. Um, I, I think everything, the way they coerced it together, it, it almost seemed... It almost seemed like you were watching some type of a production rather mm -hmm. than a convention. Yeah. So I think all those elements really helped to appeal, you know, to the emotional side of things to really Definitely. get people... Yeah. get people excited about the ticket um, because we know that, you know, at least a lot of people that we've been seeing have been saying, you know, Joe's maybe not the best, but he's what we need. So yeah. I think they did a really good job at, at getting excited for Biden. Yeah, definitely. And along those lines, I think my favorite part, the part I was most impressed with was obviously Biden's speech. I think he really blew it out of the park. Um, we've never, I think that's the best speech Joe Biden has ever given in his time in politics. Um, though it was short, it was really powerful. He stood his ground. Um, and then I also really loved after that speech and then he walked outside and everyone was socially distanced in their cars for the big fireworks show. That was, I had chills. Like that was so cool. And they truly just embraced like the COVID situation mm -hmm. and social distancing in a great way. And then him and his wife were just on the stage looking at the fireworks. And that was just really great, patriotic, good unifying moment, really, and, and in these unprecedented times. I agree, I agree. And speaking on that theme of unification, even when we were talking about the primaries, I know one of the issues the Democrats faced early on was this lack of message, this lack totally. of unification. Mm -hmm. When you had people as far left as Bernie and, you know, people as more moderate as Bloomberg. Mm -hmm. So I think they did a really good job of getting everyone on the same page that definitely, night. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. De definitely that night. I I, I just I can't explain like my chills were just oh it was it was a really powerful moment definitely very, powerful. very unifying for the Democratic Party and also potentially for Biden's presidency 
Yes, definitely. And and you know, just to play play the other side here, what was the worst part of the DNC? What could they have done mm. better, Julie? Okay, so I know your favorite part was the fact that it was all planned and they embraced the virtual aspect, but I think it didn't it didn't play out well for them uh, because it just seemed like a big commercial personally. Mm. It okay. was so planned where Every single thing was, and also they had MCs. I think also the MCs did it for them in in bad way <laughs> because it just made it so cheesy and so planned and scripted. When for conventions aren't supposed to be that. There's yeah. they're usually people in crazy hats in the crowd, and you know it was just so it seemed like a four day commercial. <laughs> um, but on that on that aspect, I think. It worked for them in a way because it was almost it was it was very depressing, mm -hmm. but I also think that was their message, you know, yeah. almost like a funeral for America and Trump's America. It was it was very sorrowful, sor and just oh, down. And mm -hmm. I think the format worked for them, so I think they got lucky with that definitely. Yeah. And it works, but I just personally thought it was so planned and just a big commercial, which. It's not what conventions are supposed to be. Go release commercials for that, you know. Agreed, agreed. And I mean, speaking on that on that sorrowful note as well, I think I, I agree with your point there. That I felt like it it did a great job at unifying people, at getting that uplift, that, that spirit, that mm -hmm. cohesive spirit. But I didn't hear a lot about policy jelly, oh, and yes. that that was something that I really wish I had heard more of. I definitely um, agree. During it, and I and that's, not yeah. once, not once in the entire DNC were was these. Uh, were, meant, were, were these Black Lives Matter riots, riots in the streets mentioned once? Not not once in the entire DNC, which is a very apparent problem in our nation right now. Um, and yeah, security. Yeah. But with that said, COVID was mentioned a lot. And so I guess we can move yeah. on to the RNC, kind of contrasting mm. those two. We all saw that the RNC barely mentioned COVID. I barely. think Melania was one of the only few to mention COVID. And then throughout the RNC, very contrastingly, um, they mentioned the Black Lives Matter rioting and bringing peace to our streets a lot. So you really kind of see the contrast in their platforms and that how they were definitely playing to their party platforms. Trump supporters want to see uh, their police back, not, no police defunded, all that kind of stuff. And then the Democrats really want to see this focus on COVID and masks. And yeah, I just think you can really see that they're playing yeah. to their bases. And right I think there. I think that even evidenced itself, not only in the lack of the lack of addressing of COVID during the RNC, but also no one was wearing masks. How, mm -hmm. do, how do we feel about I the think, actual setting? I think that was one, my worst of the RNC. Um, I feel like almost, yes, they were all COVID tested before a lot, every single day, I think, every speaker, guest, mm -hmm. but still, it's like, you can't wear a mask. Come, like, it just, it, it wasn't unifying, personally, to me. Yeah. Like, at some point, you just have to accept the fact that masks are scientifically proven to help, so just wear a mask. Just wear, and I yeah. think it was kind of just like a, a, I don't know, push to the Democrats, just to kind of prove them we don't care about you, mm -hmm. and I think it was just, it, it wasn't a good look for, for Republicans, definitely. I agree, I agree. Yeah, I think I think that was, you know, that in addition, let, let's talk about our worst parts and then we'll conclude okay, yeah. with our best parts. So that was definitely my worst. Yeah, that was okay. definitely your worst. I, I would agree with you that that was a worst. I think also Trump's speech, you know, just to spare, as, as we were saying, comparing it to Biden's speech, Trump's speech was extremely long. I remember yeah. the first comment that every every reporter had after it was wow uh, yeah that that was a lot that was a lot even coming out, everyone the biggest uh, supporters of Trump oh yes yes so I think that message definitely could have been condensed it was mm -hmm. a little bit like beating a dead but horse. with that said I will give Trump credit because I really think in this speech he was trying to play to the Republican supporters that he lost in the last election interesting and so interesting the ones who are Republican but just didn't like Trump so either didn't vote or voted Democrat. So I think this speech was definitely a not typically Trump speech, yeah. you know? Usually he goes on tangents, tells yeah, stories. Very off the cuff. You know, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's how Trump is known. And that's why his supporters love him. But that's also why people, some Republicans don't like him because he's Trump, you know? And so he did very little, if any, of the Trump antics mm -hmm. in this speech. Exactly. It was very policy oriented um, and just focused on America, not Trump. And so I think, though it was long, um, I think it was personally a great speech. And I think just overall, you could really see that he was playing to not just Trumpers. He was playing and trying to really get those voters back. Interesting, mm -hmm. interesting. 
So that sounds like it actually could have been your best part. So we've actually flip flopped mm. on a few no, of these here. No, I wouldn't here. say best. I was, just, I was giving him a little more credit for the best. speech. Okay. Because I, it also did. I thought it was a great speech, and it did annoy me how all the reporters were just hating on it for the length, mm. which I think I don't know. In, in, in the olden days, they'd give six-hour six hour speeches. speeches. Come on, I, I think it was fine. <laughs> Oh, I mean, I mean, going off of that, I, I think, you know, we, we touched on the lack of mask wearing, the lack of COVID awareness. But interestingly, given the unprecedented times, again, having the RNC at the White House mm -hmm. just added this different, this different. But it was stature. very controversial. Very that controversial. Was extremely controversial. Extremely. What did you think about it? You know, I agree it's controversial because you, you have this platform that you're already using. Mm -hmm. But I think especially for the Republican Party, having that sense of, patri of, of patriotism, having the fireworks go off with the Washington mm -hmm. Monument in the background, yeah. I think that plays very well to the audience. Definitely. That they were I personally to reach. think I can understand how it is controversial, but I really don't think they were trying to be controversial in that aspect mm. in showing, you know, showing off that he's already president. I think it was just a, a, a beautiful background for these great speeches mm. on the last night. Um, of the conventions. I think it, it really looked great. But again, their seats were like two inches apart, no, not social distance, so I don't know. But I, it, was a be it was a beautiful background. Yeah. And so would you say that's your favorite part as well, or did you have a different one? Um, I would say my favorite parts were, one, oh, we were just talking, Nic Nicholas Sandman's mm -hmm. speech. I thought that was incredible. The young boy who uh, got you know manipulated by the, by the media um, for being in a uh, Trump racist with his MAGA hat um, at a pro-life uh, rally. Anyways, he gave a speech that was, I felt like it really s stood out to the like young Republicans mm. in the nation. He was, I think, one of the few, if not only, like young Republicans yeah. speaking. Um, and just, because we also haven't heard a lot about him in recent, like so, yeah, what, what he's up to, and yeah, he kind of disappeared. And so I think he was a, a very powerful speech, speaking to young Republicans, and just that he got manipulated by the press, and he's coming back stronger than ever. So that really, really stood out to me and hit me. I also loved Ivanka's speech. I thought it was one of the best speeches she's ever given. Um, great introduction to her father. Pretty short, got to the point. I don't know. I just, I, 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 Ivanka's a great speaker, but I, I really think it was the best speech she's ever given. Um, and then again, I think I really liked the fact that it was at the White House. At the White House. Yeah. Do you think, you know, going off of that with Ivanka's speech, do you think some people were criticizing, saying, why, why is your family? I mean, obviously, Joe Biden had his grandchildren speak. Um, you know, some of his kids, like his, his family obviously played, played a role. But do you think that it's warranted? Should families in general, irrespective of Trump or Biden, do you think families should play a role in the convention? But I, I, well, yes. First yes. of all, to your question, yes. But I think it's very different for the Trump family. They're literally in his cabinet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like they're they're in the White House working with him. It's not like he's just a daughter who lives yes. across. You know, he, yeah. he's involved in his president. She, she's involved. <laughs> well, all the kids are. Um, so I think that's v very different. But also um, something that was mentioned was that usually the the uh, Trump kids talk a lot about. My father does this. My fa as a kid, he did this. But this convention and these speeches, they did very little of that and focused on actual policies and what he has done. And what, uh, for example, Tiffany Trump's speech, very, also very controversial, very shaming to the media, and v uh, the, the most harsh I've ever seen Tiffany Trump's like speak, which she doesn't speak often. But um, she did not talk about like her father at, at mm -hmm. all. Just. President Trump, President Trump. Um, which I thought was very interesting, and I don't quite sure know why. why. Why do you think? I think, you know, I think they probably have heard some of that backlash of no one wants to hear my dad did this, my mm -hmm. dad did this. I think it does add a layer of legitimacy when you say, my, like, the president did this, the president did that. Um, and just, like, reinforcing, you know, the president isn't a term you throw around lightly. Like, you're the president. Yes. So I think by adding that layer of like ethos that that really gave a lot of credibility to their claims yeah at least in my mind yeah definitely um but overall i, I think both both conventions really tailored everything they did to their audience mm -hmm. i think they both did a great job mm -hmm. at saying this is what our base wants this is what they need and they executed both mm -hmm. conventions did a great job um so i think they were great all around and i think it was really cool again unprecedented times the fact that both conventions were back to back, back that to is back. very rare um and so you could just they, obviously they were completely contrasting each mm -hmm. other, but you could really, and also it didn't give a lot of room for the polls to move. 
yes. which I thought was also very, usually they move a little okay. bit after um, both conventions, but we saw very slight. If, if anything, Trump is, was a little higher after the RNC, but again, is that just because it was the second in, in line? Yeah. I don't know. So yeah. that was also very interesting. And it was just cool to watch them both back to back. You exactly. Know? Yeah. Wow, very interesting. Um, so moving on after after the conventions, speaking to you know tailoring it to your audience, you know what base are they going after, you know what what share of these voters are they both fighting for? Because to a certain extent, I think we can all agree, pretty polarized, mm -hmm. but we're really fighting for that for that middle group of voters. Mm -hmm. um, so we have that will display on the screen. We have this graphic showing the top issues voters are concerned about for the 2020 election. And Julie, it's interesting. The economy ranks as the top. The top issue in healthcare is second, even in the age of COVID-19. How do we Crazy. reconcile this? You know, I think the economy is just always mm -hmm. plays such a big part in the election of a president. It just does. And if the economy is doing great, usually if an incumbent is the, the, if an incumbent yeah. is running, that he wins. Just to interject there, I think it's I think it's been pretty historically true within the first within the preceding 90 days. If the S&P 500 is up relative to the election from that 90 days, the incumbent always wins. Wow. So it'll be interesting. I think the stock market is going to be a, a strong predictor when we watch in the coming weeks to see how this election is going to play out. Yeah. Do you think, so currently the economy isn't great, obviously, <laughs> um, but it, it's not completely Trump's fault because of obviously the coronavirus, but do you think voters will be blaming him for the economy? Well, you know, I think the economy is such an interesting point right now because if you take a look at the stock market, which has regained all of its losses since March, it's even up for the year, on that note, things are fine. Things are looking dandy. Mm. Now, that is driven by a lot of companies that are in the tech sector, things mm. that have been supported and yeah. bolstered um, by COVID-19. But like you said, for Main Street America, for businesses that are closing, we see it, we see it in our own hometowns, mm -hmm. how if, if Trump's central platform, and I think, you know, we discussed this, the economy is something that uh, he runs on. That's like the mm -hmm. hallmark of his campaign. If he can't get those Main Street voters back to work, what's going to happen? I don't know. You tell <laughs> us. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that's a great point. Yeah. But yeah, I think it just it, it is interesting that economy is still is above healthcare. That really just shows how important the economy exactly. is to American voters. And not only look, looking at that, it goes healthcare, Supreme Court appointments, and then the coronavirus outbreak. I mean, in, in, in an age where corona literally dominates everything, yeah. even Supreme Court appointments, which don't get me wrong, extremely, extremely valid. But it's also crazy that. American citizens care so much about that. And that makes me happy. That, that makes me happy know. they're so informed. Maybe Trump Discourse informed. is doing something if people are watching out there. <laughs> I know. Um, yeah. So I think I think that was really interesting too. I think climate change, I was expecting climate change to be a little bit higher. Um, Definitely. On Especially this list. with all these wildfires now. It might, I, I, yes. I don't know when this poll is done, but it, it, I bet it's a little higher now. And now both. Um, candidates are really targeting home on climate change, exactly. especially Biden. Exactly. Uh, with yeah, all the wildfires. With all the wildfires. Uh -huh. Exactly. And the other thing I was surprised placed lower was racial and ethnic inequality. I Which think that's been that's been such a hallmark of, of the past few months and all of the efforts and all of the conversations. So it's surprising to me at least that, you know, everyone agrees that something has to be done, that that isn't on the forefront of people's minds, yeah. I think, right now. It's yeah. interesting. And it's not on this graphic, but I also saw a poll that said, um, right now, American citizens are favoring Biden when it comes to law and order in the nation, which mm. is also incredible. And it's obviously not looking great for Trump because those are his two main platforms, exactly. law and order and the economy. And right now, both aren't <laughs> great. <laughs> um, but also, polls are showing that people are favoring Biden over that, which is... And now you see the Democrats also really targeting home on, you know, Trump has been blaming the Democrats for all this violence in the cities. And then all the Democrats are now saying, but Trump, this is your America. Mm -hmm. This is Trump's America that this is all happening. So right now they're really going back and back. Whose fault is all of this? Yes. And now also the Democrats are like condoning um, all the violence and everything, which they weren't for a while. Yes. But I think that's, all, that's just very interesting. Yeah, I think, I think definitely, you know, because at the end of the day, people do vote with their pockets, so it mm -hmm. makes sense that the economy is, is one of these these issues on the front line. But I think also the debate about universal health care and things like that that Bernie Sanders was such a strong proponent of that was really guiding the election before COVID-19, everything's kind of dissipated. Definitely. Now now we're not really hearing a lot about those policy changes, um, so it'll be interesting to see. So do you think that like Amer the American public isn't, 
quite as concerned with COVID as, you know, the media or politicians are making out to be since it's what the... It's after Supreme Court after appointments, Supreme Court which is, appointments. which I understand the concern about Supreme Court um, appointments regarding, you know, people are concerned about Roe v. Wade oh, being overturned. Extremely important, extremely yes. important. But the, the likelihood of, of that... In a, during a pandemic, <laughs> during a pandemic, nonetheless, I think I think you yeah you hit the nail on the head. It's it's very interesting that it hasn't surfaced. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So we'll definitely see. And and if Corona is being overplayed by the media in some aspect, if people aren't this concerned, it'll it'll be interesting to see how that impacts people's votes definitely. as well. I also want to bring up. Are, are, are we believing these polls? Might I say, you know, like, <laughs> in, in the last election, polls like this were showing the complete opposite of what ended up happening yeah. in the election. So I guess my point is, are these even trustworthy? Like, should we even be talking about this? I mean, that's that's the role of a journalist, Julie. I think it's our job to go out there and find out. I don't I don't know mm -hmm. how we're, how we're going to be able to do that. I think it's I think these polls are representative of the information people are giving right now. I think mm -hmm. I think people who want to go and share their opinion when these pollsters are calling them up, however they're contacting them. You know, it, it, it's a it's a representative sample side size uh, mathematically it, it checks out. Mm -hmm. But you also have to wonder: Are there these inherent biases? Mm -hmm. Are you know? Are there things at play? These mm -hmm. other factors yeah. underneath the surface that we're not seeing right Definitely. now. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, moving on with tailoring to your voters' campaign strategy. So today, both Trump and Biden are in Minnesota. And they're both holding, they're both, they're <laughs> both firing up right now, Jilly. Um, Biden's planning on visiting this like trading center. He's doing town halls, whereas Trump is doing his classic rallies. So especially since early voting is starting in Minnesota for today, mm -hmm. you know, the, it's, it's ramping up. The election's here. So how, how are their different strategies even playing into these things, do you think? Man, their strategies could not be more different <laughs> right now. Well, first of all, Biden for the majority of the coronavirus was just in his basement, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, live casting from there. And I think that didn't do him very well. Um, but then again, Trump was completely opposite, holding rallies and, you know, just extremely, extremely different. Mm -hmm. But again, they're playing to their bases. As we were talking about with the conventions, the Democrats want him, don't, don't want to be going to rallies and, you know, ignoring the, this pandemic and Republicans do in a way. Um, so yes, they're, I, I don't know how successful their strategies are because yes, Republicans are, aren't, don't want Trump to be in a, locked away in a basement, but they also don't want him to be completely ignoring and you know, pissing off these, these Democrats. Um, and, and with that said, Trump recently held a rally in Nevada, mm -hmm. which was like the first um, indoor rally, I think, it, or indoor event. Um, in a long time since this pandemic, and it completely ignored every single state rule of Nevada and just, you know, was just completely not adhering to these p guidelines for the pandemic. So I, I, it's hard to say if that's hurting him or helping him, but that's definitely the strategy he's going with, that whatever, you know, the pandemic's healing, people are healing, we're, we're getting on back and we're gonna win this election. Meanwhile, Biden is definitely still embracing COVID is not over, this pandemic is still real, and is making that a, a supreme aspect of his campaign. Exactly, I couldn't agree more, I couldn't agree more. And, and on, on, that, on that note, you know, they have different strategies, yes, but in a weird way, I can't even believe I'm saying this, they almost have different strategies when it comes to voting. I oh, mean, yeah. so what, what, what is the difference between mail-in voting, absentee voting, and then let's discuss a little bit how we think that could impact the election. I know there's yeah. been so much talk about this. So there's been so much controversy. Trump's so many tweets about <laughs> mail-in voting and how this election is going to be a fraud now because mail-in voting is happening. So essentially, the difference between... And also people say, but absentee voting and mail-in voting are the same thing. They're really not the same thing. Um, absentee voting is when you get a, a approval to vote, not in person, due to a special circumstance. If we're at college, Trump doesn't live where he's voting right now, so he's an absentee voter. Uh, if you're in the military, you know, if you, you get approved beforehand, and then you get mailed your ballot. But then mail-in voting, on the other hand, and mail-in voting does include, include absentee voting, but when politicians are talking about mail-in mail -in voting, they're not really talking about mm. absentee voting. They're talking about universal mail-in voting. So states, California, Delaware, and Illinois, I think a couple others, are doing automatic mail-in voting for this election, where ballots are literally automatically mailed to eligible voters' houses. 
Um, obviously, I can see why it's controversial because mm. how, since when is that reliable? You know, mm. people, I just, it just, it frustrates me a little bit because, you know, people are going to rallies. Trump people are going to rallies and then liberals are going to protest. So clearly people can go and vote in person. Mm -hmm. And I just think it, it is gonna cause a lot of controversy over this election. And we probably aren't gonna know the results for who knows how long. I think, I think that's the really interesting implication. I think the fraud point, while, while valid to bring up historically, I mean, obviously we haven't had an election that's experienced this much mail-in voting. I, th I think we can mitigate any possible issues with fraud based on, as you were saying, you have pre-approvals, um, things like that. So hopefully, you know, fraud won't be an issue. But in terms of actual, you know, are we going to have another hanging Chad incident? And What's going to go it's on It's also so last minute. Also. Yeah. Like, so, so politicians will say, but these other states have been doing it for years and fraud, it's been proven that it's not a problem. Okay, but this is happening. People don't have time to prepare for this, to prepare for the inevitable fraud that mm -hmm. will happen. So it's just gonna be a mess of votes. And I, yeah, I agree. Now it's going around that Nancy Pelosi might be president for a little bit <laughs> if they still don't know the election results. It's just, it, it, to me, it's crazy. It's crazy. Imagine if we had our first female president oh, just like that. That would just be wild. Like that. that would be what wild. A strange <laughs> turn of events. We never thought oh, we would my see goodness. that. <laughs> And I think also just something to touch on too is the timing. So I'm sure we've all seen, like we said, the infrastructure isn't really there, whether we've seen it with the post office funding, mm -hmm. with just actual, you know, tallying the votes. The infrastructure is going to cause a time lag. So people are voting earlier to try to help mitigate that. But if you're reducing the time you have to make as a, as a swing voter, as an independent, do you think that's, whose favor do you think that works in, if anyone's, if you're voting earlier and not perhaps maybe waiting until a debate or waiting until the very end like you normally would? Um, I'd say that probably helps Biden because I was watching something the other day and it said that Trump really took the victory, though no one thought it would be, mm -hmm. in his last like 20 days before election day last, last mm -hmm. election where he went like Twitter silent, was very, very silent, not the Trump antics that we normally mm -hmm. see. And statistically that proved that that helped him. And so I think just, it's, it's not fair that some people are voting earlier. There's so many things that could happen yeah. until election day. Exactly, what if this, what if a huge bombshell case came out and you wanted to change your vote? You know what I mean? Seriously. Things like that, I think those are the, the things that people and don't there's realize. there's still how many days of a valid campaign pain season still left. I know. It's so interesting. I mean, I mean, I know I'm going to definitely try to try to hold out. Um, obviously, got my absentee ballot given that we're away from home, but it's going to be really interesting to see. Even I, I hope that they do publish some type of numbers on how many people have voted. Less, and and I think I don't know if this will help or harm necessarily, but you're definitely going to see a lot of Republicans voting in person mm -hmm. as a sort of act of defiance to liberals who are pushing for mail-in voting, and also because they want their vote to get in. You know. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we're also going to see a lot of more of the left using the mail-in voting and that aspect. So we'll see if that potentially affects positively or negati negatively. It's so, so much to it's go. It's so <laughs> interesting because we have a common theme on this and why we started Dome Discourse in the first place is to promote you know, this understanding of both sides to really just present these different things. And when we started this, I don't think I could have predicted that polarization would have extended even to the oh, simple act goodness. of voting. So I think that we just We didn't think in the 2016 election that it could get more polarized. Oh, we didn't think it could get worse. We did not it think it could get worse, worse Julie. And it did. it did. It got worse. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's, that's very telling, very interesting. With that being said, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in to Dome Discourse. Election 2020 series. <laughs> and we will be covering the Notre Dame College Republicans and the Notre Dame College Democrats will be debating here On live. Monday night. And then we'll also be covering the presidential debates ongoing uh, in Cleveland in a week and a half. So that's going to be a fun ride with Dome Discourse. And so this has been Dome Discourse. I'm Jilly Randall. And I'm Jackie Fletcher. This has been Dome Discourse, where discourse finds its home inside, inside the, the dome. dome.